I want you to try and imagine something with me. Not quite a thought experiment, but instead a projection of the past into the present, or perhaps, more accurately, a future. Think of it maybe as one of those dystopian worlds so often presented in many of the popular media narratives we see these days. I want you to imagine our present world in a not so distant future where much of the infrastructure we have come to rely on is still in existence, but important pieces of it are no longer accessible. The thing I want you to imagine being gone is the interconnected web of technologies that allow us to find our way. Things like GPS and cell phone services with their ability to locate us in space. Imagine, too, that the servers that share information across the globe are gone as well, disconnected or destroyed by some failure or negligence. It's not a catastrophic event that has led to this loss of tools, but rather a long neglect in investments required to maintain it, perhaps a defunding or de-emphasizing of education, maybe a loss of accumulated experience and knowledge required to run the systems necessary for those things to continue, or just maybe a plague or pandemic that has robbed society of many of those who might have been responsible for maintaining this electronic and digital infrastructure. Anyways, however you've gotten to this point, let's say that you're an official in whatever government is left behind. And let's ask the question, what's your job? Well, let's say, among other things, your job is to plan trips for important higher level officials so that they can get from one place to another on a schedule so that they can meet with various local officials to do the business of governing. As part of your job, you have to make sure that you plan the trip and all of the things that have to happen and have to get from one place to another to the next place, to another place, and so on. You have to arrange lodging and provisions for the traveling parties as well. And also you have to sort of think about who will meet who and when and where and all of the rest. In short, your job is to come up with what we might call an itinerary of travel for that public official. Now let's do one other thing in our imagining, one that might seem strange at first, but isn't so far out of the realm of possibility here in just a few years. Let's say that you actually don't have really detailed maps of all of the reason, regions you or that official will be traveling through and to. I know this seems a little bit weird, but bear with me for a moment. As you will recall, in an earlier episode, we discussed how much things had changed in terms of our knowledge of the space around us in just the last 100 or even 50 years. How it would have been common for someone just a few generations ago to be able to navigate across a significant distance by using the physical signs around them, whether those be in the sky or through known landmarks, in a way that most of us today are just incapable of. As we said in that episode, our ability to use the technology we have created to make these tasks easier and more reliable has advanced us tremendously in some ways, but it has also restricted and restrained us in others. In another reference to James Burke's thesis that we live in something of a technology trap, if that technology were, were to disappear, where would we be? It's not hard to imagine a time in the not-too-distant future where paper maps are anachronisms that hang on the walls of a few homes or are found in the collections of those libraries or museums that are left, but by and large are lost to many. Perhaps this is a bit of a stretch, but I hope you'll play along with me just for the purposes of this exercise. Now, if all of this were the case, how would you plan your trip? Well, you might recognize that the big roads that connect the important places are more durable than the surprisingly fragile information infrastructure we so rely on presently. Interstate and national highway systems are generally built to last, especially if there's any sort of an effort to maintain them at even the most basic level. As one can imagine then, building an itinerary by thinking about how would one would travel along these roads, at least at first, and then on more secondary paths, late state and local highways might be a good way to go. And while the physical distance that needed to be traversed might be somewhat important when planning the trip, what might be more paramount would be the times, times of travel that would depend both on road conditions and the means of transportation.
Now, if you're still with me in this exercise, perhaps you can take a moment to imagine that for wherever you live. Think about where you live and trying to get somewhere. You don't have maps, but you do have some knowledge of the local road system. For me, when I lived in Georgia, the small town that I taught in was some 17 miles from a major multi-lane interstate highway. While the secondary roads were certainly passable, they were not as well maintained and thus pr more prone to deterioration than I-75 that connected Atlanta and Macon. You had to travel more slowly on those roads, and congestion and breakdowns would probably be more likely to lead to delays. On average, you might only be able to travel some 50 miles in an hour as opposed to the distances, or should, I should say as opposed to the distances one might be able to cover on the interstate, something like 75 or even 80 or more miles an hour, depending on the traffic. Here in Arizona, that secondary road network is even more sparse and less well-maintained, covering an even larger area. In many places, on that secondary road network, speeds above 30 miles an hour are to be considered reckless for most vehicles, and there are places some vehicles would not be able to go at all. Though, by and large, you have to sort of recognize that those spaces are probably pretty sparsely populated. So lacking maps and GPS, your job is to put together a schedule of travel. What would you do? How would you plan the trip and all that goes with it? Well, I think that what you'd likely do is keep the party on major roads at pretty well estimated speeds and say that it'll take a certain amount of time to travel from one locality to the next and then another so many hours to get from that place to the place after that. Junctions and turns would be note noted with estimated times of arrival and the schedule would probably be built conservatively so as to allow for mishaps that will inevitably arise from time to time. These estimates would be based on experience. How long does it usually take for someone to travel between points A and B? How about point B and C and so on? You take into account the means of travel. That is, is the party fairly small and limited to just a couple of vehicles, or is this a large excursion with many larger vehicles carrying a myriad of supplies? The scale of the logistics would play an important role in the plan. And once you've done this, a somewhat laborious task if the trip is across a long distance, you'd probably make sure that you kept a copy or two of the itinerary in case you needed to do the whole thing again. You could also imagine that over time, if the society didn't regain its former technological attainment, these itineraries would get collected as official documents and published together in some fashion for other planners like yourself to use. Moreover, they'd be given to those whose job it was to oversee the trip itself as a set of directions, but also as much more than that as, as well. This may all seem a bit far-fetched to you now, but the truth is that for much of human history, when what maps there were were either very local or astonishingly global in nature, this is how travel was often planned. Here in the United States, such itineraries were common for circuit judges that served rural areas, a tradition taken from early British practice. Long into the modern age in Europe, nobility would announce their itineraries in just such a fashion, a practice that dated back into the medieval period. Depending on the level of nobility involved, these itineraries could be enormous in scope. Even the Romans, with the grand road network, only occasionally produced rough maps that, of that sort of interconnected web of bigger and smaller arteries, relying instead on written descriptions of what the travel times would be between various cities, imperial stations, and physical landmarks. What's so surprising in the case of the Roman Empire, I think, at least to our modern sensibilities, is that these descriptions were rarely improved upon or replaced with graphical representations, even when such advances were well within the technological capabilities of the empire's engineers and bureaucrats. Why is that, and what were the consequences of this neglect? In this episode of The Scientific Odyssey, we'll attempt to understand the modes of cartography and geography in the late Roman Empire and beyond, the period often referred to by historians as late antiquity, and we'll see if there are any lessons that might be gleaned for us today. Hello, 
and welcome to the Scientific Odyssey. The Scientific Odyssey is a mini-part journey into the history and philosophy of science. My name is Chad Davies, and I'm the writer, host, and producer of the podcast, where we consider the ideas, processes, and results of over 2,500 years of scientific inquiry and discovery. Series 5, Finding Our Way. Episode 11, Itineraries. In our last two episodes of this series, we've discussed the Roman practice of the practical aspects of cartography, road building or more broadly infrastructure construction and maintenance, and land surveying, and all of this fit well within the Latin mindset of a well-ordered and well-administrated empire. Beginning with Augustus and continuing with a number of, of his successors, the bureaucracy that ran the day-to-day -day workings of the various administrative districts made sure that these activities continued up through the crisis of the third century. In fact, one might say that during that extended period of internecine conflict and fragmentation, the only thing that might be thought of as sort of holding whatever the empire was together was this durable infrastructure and the bureaucracy that managed it. Unfortunately, as we know, these monuments to the unique quality of the Roman genius could not overcome the factors that would lead to the Western Empire's decline and dissolution, but that certainly is a story for another podcast and another time. As formal road networks were being created during the time of Augustus, the first emperor did what a lot of smart rulers do. He created a bureaucracy tasked with administrating them and then also in maximizing their functionality called the Cursus Publicus, this organization was responsible for seeing to the transportation of officials, the carrying of mail, and the facilitating of other imperial business that needed to use that growing road network. This administration was probably responsible for creating the first itineraries between places. These written route guides, used with portable sundials, would allow the traveler to navigate through the road network with relatively high efficiency. The earliest versions of these that we have come from a rather unlikely source, known as the Vicarello goblets or cups. Rediscovered in 1852, the four silver cups are thought to date to the late 1st century CE. The cups are cylindrical, resembling in shape Roman milestone markers, and they're about 4 inches or 10 centimeters tall. What makes them really remarkable, at least for our discussion, is that they're inscribed on their outside with an itinerary that goes from Gades, or modern-day Cadiz, overland to Rome, including all 104 stopping points along the way, as well as with the distances between those two stop, or between those stopping points, I should say. That's a total trip of some 1,840 Roman miles, which if we try to translate that into sort of modern units, is a little more than 2,700 kilometers and a little less than 1,700 imperial miles. While the reason for them being left at that bath complex in the Roman town of Vicarello is somewhat disputed, scholars have all sorts of ideas about it, it's pretty clear that by the time of the emperor Domitian, the work of the Cursus Publicus was well enough established that its, its documentation would be inscribed on these physical artifacts left as votive offerings at the temple there in Vicarello. As I mentioned in the introduction to this episode, sets of written itineraries would have been collected, and our best example of such a collection is known as the Antonine Itinerary. Consisting of two parts, one for land journeys and the other for sea travels, the collection seems to stem from a need to plan for the trips made by the imperial court. In this case, most likely during the reign of Caracalla, also known as Marcus Aurelius Antoninus, for a trip that he would have made in 214-215 CE. 
The version of the document we have shows evidence of additions and modifications that have been made to that original document, and so it likely dates to a later time. Entries are made as a list with the starting location, the next ending location, the distance between them, and sometimes a tally of a total, total distance traveled kind of thing. This document would have been essential for planning all of the details required for an imperial tour. As such, it offers a level of detail that would be useful for centuries to come, as well as a historical path, or a historical record, I should say, of the actual path Caracalla took through the empire just prior to his ill-fated Parthian campaign. Perhaps unsurprisingly, given the chaos that would follow the end of the Severan dynasty that Caracalla was a part of, the next important written itinerary we have dates to late in the 4th century. Known as the Bordeaux itinerary, after the importance placed in the text on the pilgrimage route from that titular city to Jerusalem, the document is really an interesting sort of recognition of what's changing in the empire. It's written sometime around 330 CE, after Christianity had become an officially recognized religion with the empire. And as such, the document reflects the growing desire by those citizens flocking to the faith to travel to various holy sites associated with Christianity. Hence, what we see here is really a cool shift from just pure bureaucratic purposes for these itineraries to cultural purposes as well. The purposes of the maps, or at least the itineraries, has changed. Contemporary with this Bordeaux document, we have a number of maritime itineraries. Given the commonality of sea travel within an empire encompassing the Mediterranean Sea, such documents are to be expected and are known in greater numbers. It is almost certain that any port of suitable size would likely have had one or more cartographers making and selling these documents to mariners from many other places. The level of detail in several of these documents is extensive, and while only some cover while some only cover local regions, there are those that span expanses that cover much of the North African coast. Before we leave this subject of written itineraries, let's pause for just a moment to consider how important these would have been in an empire that spanned thousands of miles east and west and thousands of miles north and south. I think it's helpful to consider modern road networks compared to a time when those didn't exist. As I've mentioned in these previous episodes, finding one's way via dead reckoning is a skill that has to be honed over many years. In pre-industrial societies that still practiced some level of specialization, individuals such as guides, trappers, and hunters would have provided such knowledge to those traveling through what might be thought of as sort of uncharted areas. Such an arrangement, while functional, limits just how many people can move around in an area. In our present day, having a no road network with good signage allows for people with significantly less expertise to travel with relative ease. What the itinerary does for someone who possesses this is to take a lot of the guesswork out of the trip. It allows for a level of planning that wouldn't have been possible otherwise. Imagine making that trip from Gadiz to Rome and only knowing that you're going to be following the roads. Well, which roads are you going to follow? How do you know which ones connect from one town to another? How do you know where the towns are? How do you know where to get supplies? Without someone who has made the trip several times, you really don't. And so you have to rely on sort of hiring a guide or, or hiring a, you know, a person and if you can't hire that person, well, that's got to delay your trip. But see, with an itinerary, now you've got a written guide. You know what the distance, you know, or you, I should say, you know that the distance from Cadiz to the next town is, say, 18 Roman miles. And that'll take you about six hours or half a day to get there. From that town, you'll know you'll have to go to the next town, whatever that is. And so when you get there, you maybe you're going to get a bite to eat and some water and some food for your horses. And then you find the road in that town that takes you to the next place. You still have to be somewhat competent, but you don't have to be an expert. In other words, the itinerary takes all of that guesswork out of the process of traveling from one location to another. As a modern example, Let's say I wanted to return from Flagstaff back to Atlanta. 
I know that I need to go east and that I-40 heads in that direction out of Flagstaff. But I also know that I-40 isn't going to take me to Atlanta. It just doesn't go through Atlanta. What I have to do is I have to get off of it somewhere. Well, if I don't have an itinerary or a map, but let's just say maps don't exist. So I don't have, let's say I don't have an itinerary. I don't know where I'm going to get off the road. I don't know how far apart the gas stations might be. I don't know where to get a hotel room. But if you tell me that I'll go some, say, 50 miles to Winslow and then another 25 to Holbrook and then to Gallup and on to Albuquerque and so on, I can plan my trip even without having that map. It's not as good of a, as a map, of course, or, you know, it's certainly not as good as a map and itinerary together. And by the way, for those of you who used to use MapQuest back in the day to print out directions, you know what I mean when I talk about having a, both a map and an itinerary. But boy, having that itinerary is just a huge improvement on trying to just dead reckon my way across the country by sun and sky. And it seems like such a small improvement, doesn't it? It's just a list of places and distance. But all of a sudden, the entirety of the empire is opened up to an entirely new group of people. And so the cost of doing business is reduced substantially by not having to hire one of a limited number of experts. Business can happen at the speed that business needs to happen rather than at the speed of where some guide or another, whether they happen to be in the town and available for hire or not. So often, I think, civilizational leaps are predicated on just such incremental improvements. They don't seem like a big deal until you realize how incredibly important and transformative they really are. Now, to be clear here, while we don't have examples from earlier times or civilizations, it seems unlikely that the Romans were the first to have you know, put together such a tool. One can easily imagine there have been something like an itinerary for the royal road in the Persian Empire or for the Egyptian Hellenistic rulers of Egypt associated with travel on or along the Nile. But as was the case with so many things with the Romans, it wasn't the invention of the idea that they should be known for, but rather its efficient utilization on a huge scale that made that itinerary the game changer that it was. One thing I think that strikes the modern mind as odd about this was that the written itinerary was seemingly favored over a graphical one. In other words, we might ask the question, where are all the actual maps, at least in the common imagining of that word? Today, we're conditioned to work with the graphical representations of space as a matter of course, whether these be road maps, weather maps, or maps of political boundaries and divisions, but such artifacts are only rarely seen from the Roman period. While we have many examples of cadastral maps, i.e. local maps made by surveyors to assign property ownership on a local scale, there are really only two regional or wider scale maps that are survived in some form to this present day. One of these is known as the Pewdinger Tables or Pewdinger Maps. The oldest extant copy of this document dates to around 1200 CE, though it really only enters the historical records some 300 years later. Of unknown origin, the graphical map is likely a copy made from an earlier document whose origin dates back to some time after the founding of Constantinople and before the sack of Rome, with the most likely date being somewhere around 350 CE. The tables, as they're somewhat misleadingly named, is actually a set of 11 graphical road map that lay out the arrangement of, near, of the nearly 70,000 miles of Roman roads across the empire at the time the original document was created. What's different about the map is that while it does display an enormous amount of information, you shouldn't be thinking of it as a sort of a, a proportional map where all of the axes are to the same scale as you would see on a road map today. 
owing to the limitations of writing materials, i.e. papyrus and parchment, and the storage of those materials. The map should be thought of as more of a scroll with the limited north-south extent, at least as compared to a much larger or more stretched out east and west one. Hence, the map scale along the two axes aren't really the same. Instead, what you should be thinking of is that the vertical axis is squashed to get all of the empire in on one height of the scroll sheet, while the horizontal axis is allowed to play out much more fully. I won't go into the full set of details regarding the various idiosyncra idiosyncrasies of the map, other than to note that we're missing one of the original pages, likely the one for the westmost part of Europe containing Spain and much of Britain. And to note that whatever the original document was that the tables were copied from likely incorporated even earlier materials as the tables show cities that were buried by the eruption of Vesuvius in 79 CE while also having Constantinople. By modern standards, the map seems very odd, but at the time of its creation, it would have been a huge accomplishment as it would have removed much of the drudgery out of the process of trip planning. If you're walking at three miles an hour across a hundred or even thousands of miles of distance, you're not really all that concerned about whether the map accu accurately represents the shape of the empire or the world. That's a concern for philosophers and scholars. What you need to know is where the way stations are and where you're going to take turns at junctions to get from where you're at to where you're going. Yes, having an easy to look at scale representation of the distance would be nice so that you could sort of see that correct north-south extent along with the east-west extent. But since the distances from one point to another were written on the map, you could trade that for a map that was more portable and easier to store and preserve. What you would do is you would take this scroll, in a sense, you would roll it up and you would put it in a specific type of scroll case that would protect it and allow it to be transported much more safely than if, say, you had a map that you had to fold out in a very large space. It may, be, may well be that more correct scale maps were made that would require a good bit more assembly or laying out, but, you know, that's not something that we have. The fact that no indication of these survived the, the narrow neck of the hourglass seems to be a testament either to the facility of such maps or to their lack of creation. One other notable feature of the Pudinger tables is the use of unique symbols to represent different types of landmarks. Important imperial cities such as Rome, Constantinople, and Antioch are, rep are designated differently than places such as Alexandria or in Athens. Way stations are represented with a different type of symbol than, say, an imperial villa. Places aren't merely just dots on a map, but graphical representations intended to give the user a better understanding of the journey ahead. In a modern illustration of such a technique, my wife and I recently purchased a set of glass tumblers that illustrate the geograph a, a given geographical location, say a state we lived in or a place that we visited. On the glass is a map of the major landmarks, sites of historical or cultural interest, and major cities. And these are represented in roughly accurate geographical representation or relationship to each other, though in usually stylized form. But for each of us, the artistic rendering is evocative enough to bring back memories of our various wanderings and experiences, and they would give us a sense of how to return to those locations should we wish to. I wonder if, for those who might have traveled the roads of the Empire often, things like the Puninger map might have served a similar purpose. A second similar but smaller graphical map is known as the Dura Europa shield covering. Often, the shields of Roman legionnaires would be covered with parchment for decorative purposes, and in this case, the parchment, was draw the parchment has a map drawn on it. The map was discovered at the border town of Dura Europis on the eastern bank of the Euphrates River in 1923, and it seems to be a map made by a soldier documenting the stages of his unit's trip around the Black Sea on their way to the outpost the shield was discovered at. It is very likely that the places mentioned on this parchment, 
are stages of a march of the Cohorus 20 Palmyrenorum in or around 230 CE. What this illustrates, I think, is the depth to which cartographic thinking has made its way into the wider Mediterranean world. We don't know anything about the circumstances of the making of the shield cover, of course, but the fact that it was probably created by a soldier as opposed to an officer tells us that the knowledge needed to create such a thing was pretty accessible and not thought to be merely the curiosity of a scholar or the privilege of the rich and powerful. Granted, the needs of a military unit to have access to geographic and cartographic information would likely have made things like maps more commonplace. In fact, one military manual ascribed to one Vegetaeus states, quote, In the first place, a commander should have itineraries of all the war zones very fully written out, so that he may thoroughly acquaint himself with the intervening terrain as regards not only to the distance, but standard of roads, and may study reliable descriptions of shortcuts, deviations, mountains, and rivers. In fact, we are assured that the more careful commanders had, for provinces in which there was an emergency, itineraries that were not merely annotated, but even drawn out in color, so that the commander who was setting out could choose his route, not only with a mental map, but with an entire constructed map to examine." End quote. Nevertheless, the map being found as the covering for a common soldier's shield tells us that for the Rome, people of the Roman Empire, maps and other graphical representations of space and place were woven into their everyday lives that exceeded that of the previous empires of the region around that Middle Sea. This is attested to in the coinage issued, the artwork enshrined in homes and public buildings, and in the writings of various scholarly, philosophical, and literary figures, in so much as we have them. The Romans, in this sense, were almost certainly a cartographically literate people, at least by the point of the Middle Imperial period. This, I think, is one of the really foundational things about what makes Roman culture so, well, Roman. While I'm sure that for a majority of the population at the time, the world in which they lived consisted of little more than a circular area of about 20 or 30 kilometers in diameter, there were enough people who saw a wider world in which they lived represented in some sort of map form. Whether they were merchants, soldiers, immigrants, or aristocracy, there was enough of the population that saw the empire writ large, often in cartographic forms, that it really permeated how they thought of the world in which they lived. From the coins they used to buy and sell goods, to the records of the lands they farmed, to the mosaics in the buildings where they conducted their official business. The maps they saw so showed them something larger and much more connected than would have been the case, say, in civilizations and empires earlier. Unlike the succession of empires that rose and fell to their east, which saw themselves as a loose connection of tribute-paying satrapies, or the long-lived Egyptian kingdoms who were unified by the singular natural feature that it was the Nile, the Roman Empire was knitted together by a paradigm of functional administration that included, among many other things, a sense of a world drawn together. And without question, even if the artifacts can sometimes be sparse in their witnessing to the fact, maps were a big part of this. So, what happened to all of that? Why aren't we awash in preserved maps? Why aren't there great tomes or atlases rediscovered from the Byzantine Empire? Why is the enduring symbol of this culture the road network as opposed to a great library of geographic and cartographic information? Well, the answer to some of these questions are, of course, the subject of other and much more learned podcasts in this humble offering, but let's see what we can say. First, we have to note that there is, without question, 
a drop-off of cartographic knowledge once you reach the period of the late empire and into that Byzantine period. The documents we have from that period of time in the late empire are usually copies or compilations of earlier works. And often they're filled with errors or inaccuracies that have crept in through the process of being copied by those who had no real subject knowledge and then, you know, put into the public sphere by those with little or no expertise in the subject matter. There's almost no new scholarship in any of this either. There's no new ideas, no new methods or techniques, no new questions being asked or answered. While Alexandria would continue to function for a time as the intellectual center of the Eastern Roman Empire, as that empire transitioned into what we usually call the Byzantine Empire, the creative energy that had once so animated the study of geography and cartography from that place was all but gone. What we see in its place are a couple of trends. The first is one of regression. Many of the advanced techniques mastered by the Hellenistic geographers, things like map projections, were seemingly just lost. This is understandable to a degree in an imperial system that prized practical application over theoretical exploration, but is, it is telling that even while the mathematical tools that made such techniques possible were still available, the techniques themselves fell out of use. The other, perhaps more alarming trend, was a reversion to views of the Earth that were based in a flat Earth model. While this really never likely reached the proportions that some later Enlightenment scholars would claim it did, it is notable that there were those who aggressively pushed for a return to a picture of the Earth that rejected its sphericity. So why did this take place? Well. I think it has to do with the other big trend we need to discuss, and that's the influence Christianity and the rise of Christianity will have, especially over the Eastern Empire. By the 5th and 6th centuries CE, what comes to distinguish the Byzantine Empire from the earlier Eastern Roman Empire is the dominant influence the particular flavor of Christianity found there will begin to have over all aspects of life. And I say particular flavor because we really don't have anything quite like it in the modern world today. There was a commingling of ecclesial, political, and cultural power in the Byzantine Empire that no longer exists in the world today and probably hasn't since the fall of Tsarist Russia in 1917. Christianity was completely woven in to that close that culture in a way that's just not found in our modern world. So to tie up the loose end, the scriptures, especially the Hebrew Testament, as was derived from a worldview that predated any of the later Hellenistic geography, and so it was grounded deeply in a picture of the world that was Mesopotamian, as described in an earlier episode, one where the earth is seen as a disk surrounded by an ocean with a river down the middle. As such, the Bible, probably pretty well established as a library or collections of writings by the time of the 5th or 6th century CE, was grounded in a flat earth worldview, pun intended. As one can imagine, there were those who felt that such scriptural tradition should be given preeminent authority over later work in natural philosophy done by Greek and Hellenistic investigators. This seems to have been more the case in Constantinople than in other places of the empire, but it did form a counterpoint to the spherical worldview that held for the previous seven or more centuries. One thing that should be noted here much of this may have been due to the whims of various emperors. We have good evidence that such flat earth ideas seem to sort of come and go, likely as a result of favor or lack thereof by a leader or an important figure in the imperial court, often the emperor himself. What should be understood in this, however, is that while arguments about what things should have authority were certainly at the heart of this tension, a topic we covered in our episodes on what some refer to as the scientific revolution, it shouldn't be seen that religion was opposed to the use of geography or the practice of cartography. Instead, as was often the case during this time and later, 
the church found that these tools could be a bit great benefit. As such, the church was likely responsible for much of the map making activity of this time period. Documents such as the mosaics found at Nicopolis and Madaba in churches and public buildings there make it clear that during the early Byzantine period, the church was very comfortable interweaving the threads of Greek, Roman, Egyptian, and Christian cartographic tradition to serve its needs. So with this in mind, why does the drop-off we began this section of the episode asking about take place? In the minds of some, the rise of the role of religion and the decline of the intellectual life of the Byzantine Empire are related causally. However, most modern scholarship really does give lie to this old tale. If that thesis were in fact the case, you wouldn't have the Christian church of the time taking some of the leading roles in the development of public health care and medicine, such as it was, during this period of time. Instead, I think, a more nuanced model is that likely whatever role the church's rise might have had probably contributed more to moving the focus of intellectual curiosity from things like natural philosophy to things like theology and the ever-present interest in law. The decline, I think, in the East has really to do with a couple of things. First, but you have to understand the world just becomes a really a significantly more complicated place at this period of time. There are there's the rise of Islam in the east. There's, you know, conflict continuing with with peoples in the steppes and Gothic peoples and those sorts of things. There's just an, a whole bunch of stuff going on. The, the Western Empire falls and it just takes a lot of energy to deal with all of that. Second, I think there are a lack of institutions that preserve and promote gained knowledge. While there are some, I don't think one could say that any of it comes even close to saying that there's something like the universities of middle, medieval Europe that exist at this time. As we've discussed before, it's really easy to underestimate how important these kinds of institutions are to preserving the knowledge of a civilization. And while it's clear that the Christian church in the Eastern Empire did have some institutional, you know, repositories of information, it's pretty clear that they weren't nearly as extensive and, you know, natural philosophy wasn't the highest thing on their list of priorities to preserve, owing to, I think, what we could say is the sort of the lack of the two books worldview that would arise in late medieval Europe. Third, I think there's also an arrogance that seems to have crept into the Byzantine mindset. They saw themselves as the heirs of the greatest civilization in history, one that had been further elevated by their found faith. As such, I think what happens is there's no real impetus to advance further, no desire to learn or do more. Having a book on a shelf was thought to be enough, so to speak. You didn't actually have to read the book or take it out or extend its knowledge all of that much. And so because of that, there's this slow, almost inexorable atrophy of those things that had made the ride to pro rise to prominence possible. Now that's not to say that there wasn't things going on, that there, there wasn't an attempt to do some, some good geography during the Byzantine period. Theodosius II would commission a great map of the empire in 435 CE, for example. But it's really clear that the endeavor is not an original work. It's rather, it's based on the earlier maps of Agrippa going all the way back to the period of Augustus, and then maybe supplemented with work by Ptolemy and Marinus. As far as we know, after this, there's no additional attempt uh, at, at anywhere near that kind of scale made for another almost 900 years and uh, you know during the reign of Andronicus II at around 1300 AD. It's during this time that efforts are made to rediscover Ptolemy's geography. It's almost a, a biblical tale where you know you've got the later kings of, um, of Judah rediscovering the law in the temple. This really sort of culminates a period of renaissance in the Byzantine Empire that began in the late 10th century and continues for almost 400 years with various fits and starts until 
as the walls sort of close in on the empire, scholarly works and, and scholarly individuals begin to flee the empire towards Rome and Italy in a, a movement that will spark the Renaissance there. These efforts, therefore, really serve as an important bridge for cartography from the period of antiquity to the, you know, and this, this medieval, early medieval period to the rise of a European tradition of cartography at about the same time as this transfer is taking place. This notwithstanding, however, the Byzantine contributions to cartography are really quite meager and uninspiring. The vital energy of geographical inquiry, as was the case in so many areas of natural philosophy, has to be found in other places and in other cultures. As we wrap up this episode, we're going to leave the world of the Mediterranean and of Europe behind probably for a good little while. There are other cartographic traditions for us to explore, and so it is towards those horizons we will point our bow. As such, we may find that we leave behind some of our time-based framework as well. As we consider these other cultures and traditions, we may find that we jump forwards and backwards a bit in time. Our first step will be to head to that other great cradle of civilization, Southeast Asia. And when we get there, we're going to consider both the Chinese tradition of cartography, but also those found in other adjacent areas. As always, our deepest thanks to the folks at the Blue Dot Sessions for the use of their music to accompany our explorations. You can find out more about their compositions by going to their website, www.sessions.blue. Also, thanks to all of you who are part of the crew for continuing along in this journey. I hope you all are safe and healthy during this difficult time. Perhaps one day I'll release a bit of a digression relating what it's been like to try to teach during these times, but as with so many other things, it has been a challenge. For those of you who are working on the front lines of this pandemic, the healthcare workers, you have our deepest gratitude and thanks. I know it's not much, and you just as soon as have everyone follow the good practice guidance of your local health experts, but know that you are in our thoughts and our prayers. For those of you who know folks who are serving those who come down with the disease, if you can, reach out and let them know they're appreciated. Maybe bake them some cookies or write a note of thanks and let them know they aren't alone. And most of all, follow the directions they're giving to us to stay healthy. Wear masks, socially distance, wash your hands, all of those things. Until the vaccine that's been recently developed becomes available to the population at large, that's the best way for us to keep this pandemic under some kind of control and have the best chance to make it out safe and sound. The burden is great for these folks. Let's not add to it by being selfish. And in doing so, I think we can navigate through this narrow place. Due to the incredible work of researchers around the globe, that great technology against this disease, a vaccine, is nearly upon us. Hang on as best you can for just a little while longer, and soon we'll be in less harrowing circumstances, and we'll be able to return to whatever parts of our previous lives we wish to take back up. Until next time, full sails on your journey. <laughs>